Ben Kentish, who's literally sat down, he's been on the search for stories in Westminster throughout the day. It hasn't been too difficult to find any, has it, Ben? Uh, Matt Warman is Conservative MP for Boston and Skegness. He's a former minister. Uh, Lou Haig is Shadow Transport Secretary and Labour MP for Sheffield Healy. And Tom Skinner, the businessman and reality TV star who has appeared on The Apprentice and Celebrity Masterchef. So many jokes that we can tell about that during the course of the next hour. So we're looking forward to your questions. Actually, it's a full switchboard at the moment. You're overloaded with questions, but keep them coming. 0345 6060 973. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. And the prize for first question of the day goes to Callum in Preston. Hello, Callum. Hi, Ian. Thank you for having me. And hi to the panel. Um, yeah, I'll try and be brief. So during the pandemic, um, hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives, not just of COVID, but of other ailments as well. Um, every single one of them left a family behind. Those families made huge sacrifices and had really difficult decisions to make, such as, should we visit our loved ones in hospital? Many of us didn't. We weren't able to spend the last dying moments with our loved ones. And we made those sacrifices because those were the rules. Meanwhile, the government, number 10, and those in charge were flouting the rules, were partying, and are now laughing about it and making digs about Jimmy Savile in Parliament. Is it not the case that it is, in fact, the government who have lost all sense of proportion on this? And is it not true that they are simply out of touch? Matt Warman, I've got to come to you first. What do you say to Callum? So what I'd say is huge numbers of people made immense sacrifices and no one is diminishing how important those sacrifices were and they were done in pursuit of trying to defeat a, a deadly virus and we were all I think trying to, to do the right thing and the Prime Minister has apologised sincerely and, and I think but you profusely. say we all were trying to do the right thing obviously the Prime Minister wasn't and many well, people no, in Downing no, no, Street no. weren't I, th I, think, I think what the Prime Minister has said is that where he's, he's admitted that uh, clearly, some things were not done right in number 10. And By he's, him? And he's said that he is very sorry for all of that. And, and he's not going to prejudge the, the report from the police, and, and I don't think anyone would uh, expect him to. But there is genuine contrition there. I think you've seen repeatedly genuine apologies. No one, I think, is saying that people who went through the immense privations that we've just heard about. No one is saying it's okay for other people to break the rules. Could, could you explain to me then, if there are genu genu genuine apologies, why does the Prime Minister tell Conservative MP after Conservative MP that he hasn't done anything wrong and that it's all a fuss got up by the media? So that, if I'm honest, that's not what I've heard from him. What I've heard from him is genuine apology for for instance when he talked about he went out into the garden of number 10 and he said to the commons he said repeatedly i should have sent people back inside i shouldn't have done what what i did and you believe that he means is, that I, I i do believe he means that and i think he means that because he knows as he said today it's not just about were you obeying the letter of the law it's about what does this what signal does this send and i think he was absolutely right to say this is about uh, the the impression that it gives. And one of the reasons that he thinks it's, it's, it's a bad thing is because he knows there are huge numbers of very real other issues out there in the country that the government has got to deal with. And the fact that we are talking about this stuff is deeply... It, it, deeply damaging. Whose fault is that? And and, and he, and he <laughs> exactly, that is why he has apologised. That is why, for instance, you mentioned uh, that, that, that he, he's talked to the parliamentary party today. It's why he's talked and, and about making meeting, changes in number 10 And I gather he got well. a pretty frosty reception. So, you're, you're right, I was in that meeting and that's not how I would describe it. Uh, but uh, mem members of Parliament are entitled to uh, tell people uh, their impressions and I appreciate some people have said uh, that, that they came away with a different impression. What I came away with uh, was that he said that he acknowledges that changes have got to be made in Number 10, that the government has got to get on with the job of dealing with everything from Ukraine to uh, that, that finishing the COVID vaccine rollout to all of those things that have put the economy in the 
extraordinary position relative to, relative to other countries that it's in today. But no one is more frustrated than the Prime Minister at the fact that we are talking about this stuff. And he acknowledges that a lot of that is down to him. That's why he's apologised. Well, why are you defending him so much? Because, I mean, he sacked you as a junior minister. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, look, it's, I, find, so, I just find the psychology of that quite interesting. So, so I think do the way, the way I would put it is is this is as as you say he uh, dispensed with my services at the reshuffle. Um, I I don't I don't have to be here saying that I think he's the the right man right now for the job. I, I'm doing that because. I genuinely think it's true. Now, you may think that that adds some uh, heft to the argument. You may think that it doesn't make any difference. But I genuinely think if you look at the big calls throughout the course of the pandemic, the economy wouldn't be back to where it was pre-pandemic. The vaccine rollout wouldn't be where it is. Just all of those your things, services too. That, that was all of those today. things. Well, you may you may argue that that's a testament <laughs> to his good judgment. Um, the uh, all, all of those things to me do say that this is someone who gets in, the big calls in, right. In the end, doesn't it come down to the fact that he told Parliament that many of these events hadn't even happened mm. and that the rules have been obeyed at all times? Well, we now know that is not the truth. And when a Prime Minister lies to Parliament, he's broken the Ministerial Code, and the Ministerial Code says if a Minister does does that, they have to resign. That's surely what it comes down to. Well, I think you're, you, you are prejudging an, an, an awful lot of, no, I'm not, I'm of not. what is there. We, we, know that, we know that he was wrong when he said that these events hadn't happened. We know that he was wrong when he said he hadn't been at some of them. So I'm not prejudging anything. I'm just stating the facts. So he's he's said as as and, and we can we can go through the, the 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 many and various statements that that he's made to Parliament. He's talked about going out into the garden at Downing Street to thank staff who were working her, her, Herculean hours in order to get that vaccine rollout done, in order to make that progress that the country needed to see. He's talked about all of that stuff, and I don't begrudge him going out to thank those even staff who were broke, working incredibly hard. Now, what, what, but and I also think it's right that he said that with hindsight, he should have found a different way to do that. Okay, all right. Now, this is not the Matt and Ian show. I want to bring, oh. in, I want to bring in Lou now. Um, Keir Starmer, I thought, made some quite telling points, particularly at the end of his comments. Um, obviously, you are going to say that the Prime Minister should go, but did you not expect to see a bit more of a vigorous performance from your leader? Well, I think... Boris Johnson just got the tone completely wrong today and I think Keir looked like the exact opposite of Boris uh, in that he was a statesman, he exudes integrity and he spoke not just about the real and deep anger that is being felt in the country right now and that anger is felt because by and large the public did respect and abide by the rules and they did so, as Keir said, not just to protect themselves but to protect to the wider community. And not just that anger and upset, but Keir spoke, I thought, very movingly about the guilt that a lot of people are feeling at the moment and the, the terrible choices that a lot of them had to make and now are asking themselves whether those choices were right, whether it was the right thing to not see their parents in their last days, whether it was right not to spend crucial time with their grandchildren. And I have a constituent, and I know he won't mind me speaking about him because he's already spoken on the media, whose son took his own life about this time last year in uh, in that last lockdown. And he has spoken out about whether it was the right thing for him to do not to spend those last few weeks with his own son mm. and has questioned whether he could have saved his son's life. And the fact that he is having to have the, that conversation with himself and with his family and wonder whether that was the right thing to do comes as a direct result of the fact that the Prime Minister, his leader, the man who set the rules in Downing Street, was flagrantly breaching them. Can I also get your reaction to the Prime Minister... Uh, Prime Minister's attack on Keir Starmer saying that he spent more time as DPP prosecuting journalists than prosecuting Jimmy Savile and then seemed to allege that Labour front benches were all on drugs. I think, I mean, I was in the chamber when he said that. It was genuinely quite a shocking moment just when you think you can't be shocked mm. anymore by this man. Um, he is clearly in a very desperate state to be reeling out things like that. He's made that claim before um, about Jimmy Savile. Um, there were there have been independent investigations and proof that that was not the case, that Keir Starmer had no uh, involvement in the initial decision not I mean, to charge. Matt, but then, weren't, weren't you embarrassed by that? 
So I think these these claims around uh, kids. Well, I, don't, I don't want to go into. I, 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 I think I think you, you, you're you're right not not to necessarily get, go into those. But I think ultimately the the question that you mentioned about drugs it it was a Labour MP that raised that question. It was a response from yeah, the but Prime then Minister. You, then you I, be I think Prime ministerial, don't you? And that's it. It seems to a lot of people that the Prime Minister is incapable of rising to a parliamentary occasion mm. and acting like a prime minister. So that I, was not a time for knockabout, was so, it? So I, I think Parliament, when it's talking about Sorry, this Louise. stuff, it is, is, is pretty unedifying. And, and, and I, I don't dispute that for, 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 a, for a second. And, and what, what I would say, though, is that is why we all, and I think Lou's probably on the same page on this to some extent, we would all rather be talking about mm, that okay. big picture stuff. Um, ben Kendish, let's go back to Callum's question. Have Number 10 and the government lost all sense of proportion? Are they, in fact, completely out of touch? Well, the thing that Number 10 are trying to do to get through this is, of course, win over Tory MPs. So speaking to them tonight, Boris Johnson making lots of promises, hinting at a ministerial reshuffle, promising to slim down the team in Number 10, promising to listen more to his backbenchers. And for some Tory MPs, not all, but for some, that went down really, really well. They do feel, yes, he's listened, yes, he gets it, yes, he's going to change. The, problem, the problem for the Prime Minister is those issues, those things that he was pledging to his MPs, are not the things, I would suggest, that anyone in the public gives a damn about. They don't care about the size of Number 10. They don't care what communication Boris Johnson has and how with his own MPs. What they care about is did the Prime Minister and or his team break the law at a time when other people were facing fines for doing similarly? And that is the question that we still don't have the answer to. Uh, 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 Sue Gray alluded to it in her report in a pretty damning phrase. She said that the uh, behaviour in Number 10 didn't just represent a serious failure to design Observe, uh, to observe the high standards expected at the w working at the heart of government, but in also of the standards expected of the entire British population at the time. That's about as far as a civil servant can go in suggesting that, in her view, the rules that were being followed everywhere else were not being followed by people, to use her phrase, at the heart of government. Now, Boris Johnson can, to an extent, point to the police investigation and say, well, we can't prove that, we have to wait and see. But that is true, but it's also why tonight he is still in a very, very perilous position because if the Met prove or find, and it's if, if at this point, that he or his team did break the rules, did break the law, then he can promise all he wants to his backbenchers in terms of internal changes, but the public will make their minds up on that fact, I suspect, and that fact alone. What happens if the Prime Minister gets a fixed penalty notice? Well, the first question <laughs> is, do we know? Number 10 this morning refused to say for sure that we would even find out because, of course, the Met would give it to him. He might pay it. And ultimately, it's up to them whether they tell us. But this is the big question. If the Prime Minister is found to have broken the law which would be the case if he had been uh, given a fixed penalty notice. Many Tory MPs that I was speaking to are of the view that that would be a resignation matter. Okay. The other thing he could do that would warrant that would be, Ian, as you touched on, the uh, accusation that he misled Parliament. That one's a bit more difficult to prove. But if he is given a fixed penalty notice, he will be in a very, very difficult situation. Tom Skinner, what do you make of all of this? It's all madness. <laughs> it's all, it's all, it's all, let's be honest, right? So the guy that runs our country, Boris Johnson, has told everyone to stay in, don't see your family, you're locked in your homes. It was a heartbreaking time. There was old people who hadn't seen people for months, um, not even getting going out and getting food, you know? It, it was a terrible, terrible time for this country, and it was a very hard time. And if the man that he's going to be leading us and has told us, look, you're doing this for the greater good, you've got to stay indoors, then goes and has a party, well, it's bang out of order. It is bang out of order. But then, I mean, let's be honest as well, I know 99% of people did stick to the rules, but there are a fair few that, that did have the odd person in their back garden, that did have the person, the neighbour pop round during lockdown. It's going to happen. Not everyone, and, and listen, people who, even the people in, in Parliament who are giving it to him and giving, tell me every single one, because they're all going to lie, aren't they? They're none of them are going to, none of them are going to say, oh, listen, I, I def, it's, it's, look, it's just, I think that the majority of the MPs, and, and I'm going to maybe say the truth, they're all as bad as each other. 
You're all as bad as each other. <laughs> no, but, um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not everyone. I'm, 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 everyone you know, apart you've just, from the people that I'm exactly. meeting in the studio. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've avoided mentioning Keir drinking beer in offices, all of this stuff. I, I, I think well, it you is, haven't now. Have it, you? I haven't now. No, you're quite right. Um, but, but, but I think that the point is that there is a real problem that the, the public I, I, that, that is of you and I, 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 I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth but I suspect Lou also hears people saying exactly the same thing as, as you have and there is a there is a trust issue mm. around, I mean the hospitality around... trade is on its knees I mean it's, it's just started getting back get they're all having a beer in there yeah, pubs can open. It's not mm. fair, is it? Let's like we've got to think of the people that have suffered. Like it's all, it's okay for everyone to say, well, it was only a bit. People didn't leave their homes, mm. didn't see their, their 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 loved ones in their last breath, and then they're having a party. And oh, it's only the media throwing it well out of proportion. Well, it's not really. You know, it's not. Well, when you talk to your colleagues in your business, your customers, is is this now a daily topic of conversation? Everyone speaks about it. You know, it it. it it, it, it's, well, they certainly do on this stage. Well, there's nothing else to speak about, is there? Let's yeah. be honest. I mean, the next thing is going to be war or something. I don't, I don't, it's, <laughs> it's a very might, depressing time. We might time. come on to It's that. a very depressing time that we live in at the moment. <laughs> well, we might come on to that in just a moment. 0345 6060 973. Just had um, a text from my friend Tom Skinner saying, have you not invited the wrong one on tonight? <laughs> there we are. It's 17 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 21 minutes past eight on LBC. Um, Tom, you've been looking at Twitter during the break. Do you want to give a, a, a dispassionate report on what people are saying? It's just Matt's getting a bit of stick, really. <laughs> 
Half of the course. <laughs> Indeed. Well, let me reintroduce my panel. Lou Haig is Shadow Transport Secretary, Labour MP for Sheffield Healy, Matt Warman, Conservative MP for Boston and Skagness, um, very own Ben Kentish, uh, Tom Skinner, uh, reality TV star, businessman, West Ham fan. He's all, right, he's all right by me. Are you going to be on I'm a Celebrity? Is that the next one? But I'm going to book his favourite at the minute. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> Would you say yes if they asked you? 100%. Yeah, right. What are you afraid of? I want to get. I want to lose a bit of weight. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason I'm going on it. How much have you put on at the bookies? <laughs> <laughs> right, let's uh, go to Ravin in Croydon. Hello, Ravin. Hi there, panel. Good evening to you. Um, yes, um, my question is this. Has Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party answered the very difficult 2019 essay question, which is, given Labour's catastrophic defeat and the mountain they now have to climb, what would it take for them to be even remotely plausible contenders to win the next election? So what you're implying is that the Conservative Party imploding is the answer to that essay question, rather than Labour maybe coming up with any reason themselves? Yeah, well, at the moment, uh, uh, from my perspective, I'm obviously Labour can do things for themselves, but right now, the, the Conservative Party, are literally, and, and Boris Johnson especially, with his lack of contrition, uh, with the way that he's lied to the country and Parliament and held us all in contempt for the sacrifices that we all made, or most, or 99% of us made, I'm sure there's a few people that didn't, um, he's, you know... He, when you have people like Isabel Oakshaw, put, you know, saying how great Keir Starmer was today and saying that they need to get rid of Boris Johnson, you know that man's in trouble. Lou Hay. Well, uh, I think um, clearly Labour have to do more than um, simply be the uh, best of uh, two worst <laughs> options. It's not good enough for us to sit back and watch the Tories um, implode amongst themselves. Um, but as I said earlier, you couldn't find two more different characters than Keir Starmer and Boris Johnson, and I think that's been demonstrated in very stark terms over the last few weeks. Boris Johnson is a man who, when caught out, um, his natural instinct is to lie and cover up, whereas Keir Starmer is a man who's dedicated decades to public service and I think really exudes integrity and decency. Um, and I think, you know, come the next election, the British people will be faced with two very stark choices, and um, we've come a long way from that crushing defeat in 2019. We've still got some way to go, um, but I think those choices are coming ever clearer to the British public. But you have got now maybe 18 months before an election, possibly a bit longer. You accept that it's now up to Labour to put forward what they would do. That yep. You just can't rely on the uh -huh. Conservatives continuing in this way. Absolutely. And that's why we're putting forward, I think, policies that really demonstrate what a Keir Starmer-led Britain could look like. Things like the windfall tax. Really serious um, policy proposals that would help people with their energy bills in the here and now. This is the problem, as Matt said earlier, because we're... Ab we're talking about the scandal that this government is mired in day after day after day. We're not able to talk about the real crises that are facing people. There is a genuine catastrophe in living standards in this country at the moment. Inflation is soaring. Real wages are down for the first time in years. Pensioners are going to face a cut this spring. And um, energy bills are set to soar when the, when the energy price cap is lifted. People are genuinely fearful for that. And whilst all that's happening, the, the government doesn't have a single word to say about but it. But in a way, it's in your interest to let this crisis... I mean, David Davis was on earlier and he was saying this is going to be death by a thousand cuts. Mm -hmm. Now, in your party political interest, that's probably a good thing for you because the longer Boris Johnson hangs on and his backbenchers are having a go at him and there's this image of disunity, the better that is for you. So in a sense, if this is still going on, say, May, June, it's a problem for you, isn't it? Because you can't get the agenda, you can't grab hold of the political agenda with eye-catching new policies while the Tory party's ripping itself to shreds. Well, sure, but let me tell you, I don't want a day to continue where my constituents are suffering in the way they are at the moment with their incomes falling and them genuinely fearful about being able to pay their bills. And I think, you know, the, the defection 
two weeks ago of Christian Wakeford to the Labour Party wasn't just uh, a signal that he had no confidence in Boris Johnson, but it was a recognition that none of his potential successors could fix the problems facing his Berry constituents in the same way that I'm confident that none of his potential successors could fix the problems facing mine either. So I think regardless of how long Boris Johnson continues, um, the Tories will face the similar problems come the next election because the whole of the Tory party has been dragged into the gutter with Boris Johnson. You've got perfectly decent MPs like Matt being forced to come out and defend the completely indefensible and that's a problem permanently for the Tory brand. Um, Tom Skinner, what would it take to get you to vote Labour? Well, I don't know. I think the problem with Keir Starmer um, is he seems like the type of fella that if the girl in a pub gives someone a... Fr- I'm going to explain how I explain it to anyone, right? If the, girl, if the girl working behind the bar, right, was to pour someone a free pint, he's the sort of fella that would ring up the land on the grass or up. That's, 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 that's how I could explain to his thumb. Don't you want that kind of guy running the country, though? <laughs> Abiding by the rules? Yes and no. Like, <laughs> you've got to abide by the rules, but then you've got to give a little bit as well. And I mean, I think Labour's... Look, Labour's problem at the minute is... That if they don't get if they don't get Boris Johnson out now, they're not going to in eighteen months, are they? And I think that's the problem that that that, that, that they're facing. And I think it's a big push. I mean, that's so you think he can recover the position? Yeah, yeah, he has, I do. I mean, yeah. He has done before, but that normally when a politician or a government loses the trust of the people, you think back to John Major. Um, and there are lots of other examples. It's quite difficult for them to recover from that. But you think he can? I think he will. I think, I mean, look, I am, I'm not very good at politics, honestly, I'm, I'm that's not, you, I, that's, that, that's, that's why you're right to me, you got me on here, right? <laughs> I just, I just go to work every day and, and I listen to it and watch it on the news and, and it baffles me because none of them just talk any sense. They don't, honestly, they, there's never a straight answer. Why can't any politician, and I'm not, I'm not digging out because I know there are ones that are, but the, the majority of them, they all make, make it bad for everyone else because they don't tell the truth. I try doing my job. <laughs> well, he, do, he does try to do my job sometimes, and very well he does too. I don't know about that, Ian. <laughs> but what, I mean, what Labour has to do is absolutely huge. They have to win back a majority... Have, have to win back 120 seats just to get a majority of one. They have to win back seats in Scotland. They have to win back seats, of course, across the so-called Red Wall. But they've got to win back seats in cities too. Uh, and, and that is difficult because that is very different groups, very different parts of the country, who in some cases all want very different things. So it is incredibly difficult for Keir Starmer. There's a few things he needs to do. The first he started to do, and I think that is win back some uh, semblance of economic credibility, uh, getting voters to trust him and his party with their money. Bit of progress made there. Second thing he's got to do is, and he's doing, trying to do this, is talking a lot about patriotism, about convincing people on things like crime and security, that he is someone who just gets it and who cares about their security. But the end, the big third issue is about leadership. And this is where, as Tom would say, he, he struggles. When you talk to voters and when you look at the polls and the focus groups, so many voters still say, I have no idea who this man is. I have no idea what he stands for. I don't know anything about him. The good news for Keir Starmer, in a sense, is he still has a bit of time to start to flesh that out. The bad news is he's pretty fast running out of time. Gave a big speech uh, last month, earlier this month, in fact, where he sort of summed up his vision as security, prosperity and respect. Ian, you find me a politician who doesn't agree with any of those three Mm. principles. So he's really got to start fleshing it out in terms of policy, things like the cost of living, things like the NHS, because in a way, those are the issues where Labour should be most at home. And yet for now, they're still very, very thin on policy. And that's why people say, OK, Give, I'll give you a chance, but who are you and what would you actually do? And on that question, there aren't many answers just OK, yet. Matt Woman. I mean, what Ben is doing is articulating what an extraordinary politician uh, Boris Johnson is. That he, He's the Heineken... He? He's the Heine- he, well, he, look at that majority. He's he's the Heineken politician. He reaches parts that uh, others can't reach, but yeah, he's also, uh, he, he's also a Marmite in, politician. Right, that might be a terrible co- cocktail. Right but. Tense because I, I agree with you, he was able to do that, but I wonder whether that's the case now. Well, I think, uh, as, as, as you heard a minute ago, that there are people looking at the extraordinary situation that we're in now and saying, yeah, I think this is more than recoverable. That is, as I say, testament to uh, Boris Johnson's track record and, and to what I think he could do in the future. Now, he's not complacent about that. You wouldn't have heard the apology that you've heard today uh, if he didn't need to make it. But I do think uh, that you'd be mad to write off Boris Johnson. 
OK, we'll have another Twitter report from Tom Skinner in just a few minutes' time, see what people are saying, oh, no. and we'll take more of your calls, 0345 6060 973. Ravin, thank you for your question. It's 8.31, Andy Ivey has the news headlines. Boris Johnson is promising to change the way Number 10 works following the publication of Sue Gray's interim report into parties in Downing Street and Whitehall during lockdown. The limited inquiries criticised failures of leadership and judgment. The Metropolitan Police are investigating 12 gatherings, including one said to have been held in the Prime Minister's own flat. Officers have received more than 300 images and 500 pages of information from the Cabinet Office. The Foreign Secretary Liz Truss says she's tested positive for Covid and is working from home while she isolates. Earlier, she appeared in the Commons Chamber to update MPs on the situation in Ukraine and had been due to travel with the Prime Minister to Kiev tomorrow. LBC weather, windy tonight, rain in the west, a low of 2 degrees. Tomorrow, sunny spells in the north, patchy rain elsewhere, a high of 12 degrees. This is LBC. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 8.34. Lou Haig from Labour. Matt Matt Warman. I nearly called you something else. <laughs> Thank uh, you very much. From the Conservatives. Not on Twitter. <laughs> ben, ben Kentish from again. LBC and Tom Skinner, who's general all-round good guy. He's going to tell us what Twitter's saying. Just still about Matt, really. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's off. go to Janine, who's in Rotherham. Hello, Janine. Oh, it's a text. I can't read, can I? Do the panel agree that the PM pushing fake news about Keir Starmer letting Jimmy Savile off the hook is a total slap in the face to his victims? Well, we, we mentioned this earlier on. Um, ben Kentish, let's come to you first. 
Well, it was pretty ill-advised, Ian. It was pretty ill-advised because Boris Johnson was there to try and win the support of his MPs and a lot of them were pretty unhappy about the tone of that remark. In fact, the whole appearance in the Commons did not go down well with his MPs at all. He won some support back by speaking to them in private. But that was the sort of the, the centre of their consternation and their concern. As you said, really, he needed to appear serious, he needed to appear contrite, he needed to appear prime ministerial. He started doing that with the apology at the start. He then tried to talk about the record of his government and do a bit of sort of typical boosterism. But he really strayed into just uh, going after Keir Starmer. I think he was a bit rattled because Starmer had used particularly an unusually personal language about the Prime Minister. He talked about through his life, him sort of throwing people around him under the bus and sort of dragging everyone around him into the dirt and so on and so on. Starmer doesn't usually do that. He clearly decided to do it today. I think Prime Minister was a bit rattled and in return sort of went on the personal attack too. But it was the wrong moment to do it. It didn't do him any favours and I suspect many of his team, who some reports suggest warned him in advance not to mention the Jimmy Savile case, yeah. are pretty uh, frustrated about it tonight. That's kind of what did it for me when I learned that it was all pre-planned. He'd, he'd said to his advisor, I'm going to do this. And they said, no, 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 really don't. And then he did it anyway. And you think, well, that, it, well, I don't know what that's an indication of. Tom Skinner. It's like a couple of kids in the playground, isn't it? You did that, you did this. Can't they just grab a backbone and just sort it out? <laughs> if only it were that simple. <laughs> no, but it's, it's stupid. But what, lesson, what lessons, I mean, given your business experience, given your experience on The Apprentice, I mean, what lessons can could Boris Johnson learn from actually being in business? And Because, uh, uh, I mean, being a leader, it's about being a leader, isn't it? I don't know how many people you employ, but you are their leader. Mm. They look up to you. And if you do something stupid, obviously you're going to lose their support. You've got to set an example. Like, I'll, t I'll tell you from my experience. So, look, I'm a small business. We've got 12 staff in total. And, like... That I, I enjoy being like the most of us, but I'd always make sure I'm up first thing in the morning and go to work, you know? And and, and the boys now deliberately say, well, I ain't drink, drinking during the week because I've got to drive the van or I've got to be in the warehouse or I've got to be in the office. And if I do it, they'll do it. If I was to go out drinking all night and not turn up, well, they're going to do it as well. Mm. And and I think by him making remarks that Boris Johnson makes, it's just a sly little dig person, that's what I think. And now, now everyone around him thinks he's going to write to do it as well. I just think you've got to set an example, set a president and, and be a strong person and say the correct things. So so when they say to you tomorrow morning, I heard you on the radio with your flashy mates. Yeah. <laughs> listen, yes. they'll be in bed by now. They start at 4am. Oh, right. <laughs> they, they listen to Steve Allen in the morning going to, going to work. That inspires them for the That's rest it, of the day. That gets them reared up and ready to go. <laughs> Matt. Um, so, look, I think uh, Keir Starmer's ad hominem attacks were, were pretty... Uh, unedifying. Uh, I think uh, the PM chose to fight fire with fire. I think there are lots of times when, particularly when I go into school... What, what were um, Keir Starmer's personal attacks? So I, th I think Keir talked... I, I mean, I'd rather not reiterate them, uh, but, but, but Keir, Keir, Keir talked about the, the, the Prime Minister uh, making everything he touches worse in, in, in his personal life rather, rather than uh, anywhere else. I, I think that's not what Parliament is for. And, and I, I'm really struck when I go into schools and, and people often say that we watch the House of Commons, why, why are you all shouting at each other? And, and, and I think we all get... But they don't really mean it because they quite like it, otherwise they wouldn't watch. No, no I, so, so I think maybe the adult Maybe well, I was going to say maybe the teachers. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare cast such aspersions. But maybe, maybe sometimes it's good theatre for adults. But I think it's not always a, a great example. And we we're often told we, we should do better. I think we all get caught up in 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 the the theatre of it. In the it is a very partisan sort of oppositional setup, and, and it doesn't always produce the highest standard of debate. But that's not the point. We we do need to get on with tackling both the issues that we were talking about today and all those I other issues. What, what that about going about back well? to Janine's question about um, uh, it was do the panel agree that the PM pushing fake news about Keir Starmer letting Jimmy Savile off the hook is a total slap in the face to his victims? So, look, I think I would not... I, I, I've never been Prime Minister, I'm not going to uh, know whether I, whether I can definitely say that's not how I would have done it, but I know that I listened... Well, you could uh, say that you wouldn't have done well, it. Well, no, but, but I, I listened to, uh, sta standing with other MPs who were pretty cross at the way that Keir Starmer was going uh, for the Prime Minister, I can say that I would probably uh, have been pretty cross back at them. Cross and, enough and, to just... And, Throw lies back across. So, 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 I think this this claim. I mean, as 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 Ian said, I, I don't think we necessarily want to get into the 
detail of that, but but this is a claim that has been around for a long time. Well, let, let, let me just give the full fact explanation of this. Uh, Mr Starmer was head of the CPS when the decision was made not to prosecute Saville, but he was not the reviewing lawyer for the case. An official investigation commissioned later by Starmer criticised both prosecutors and police for their handling of the allegations. Lou Haig. Yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, I was I was genuinely shocked to hear the Prime Minister repeat what has been shown independently to be a completely incorrect um, allegation. And let's remember, this is the same Boris Johnson who, on this very radio show, said that money spent on historic child sex abuse allegations was spaffing money up the wall. Those were his exact words. Janine's from Rotherham. I've represented Rotherham abuse victims. Um, it's genuinely been the most traumatising, harrowing experience of my life. And anybody who's had to um, hear their testimony and work with people like that would know you should not and cannot throw allegations like that around because they know the consequences that has for victims. The, po- the reason why Keir, very unusually for him, and it is unusual for Keir to get personal, went there today was because this is about the Prime Minister's character. He wasn't just throwing around allegations or name-calling across the dispatch box. The reason this is a problem at the moment is because we are led by a Prime Minister who has chosen to continually lie uh, and cover up about many, many parties and rule-breaking in Downing Street. And it is a question, as Sue Gray has found, of his leadership and judgment. And that's what Keir was putting to him today. Okay, um, Janine, thank you very much for that text. Let's go to the next caller. It's Terry in Watford. Hello, Terry. Hi, Ian. Hi, panel. Hi. Hello. My Hi. question is, should a weakened prime minister be negotiating with Putin? Will he make the crisis worse? Now, he was due to have a conversation with President Putin this afternoon, but he was in the House of Commons when that was supposed to have taken place, so it's been postponed. Um, he's travelling to the region. I think he's actually going to Ukraine at some point during the course of this week. Are you going with him, Ben? Not that we know of, and he's going tomorrow. Is as, he? As things stand, journalists haven't been invited, which is unusual, but it was a bit of a last-minute trip. Um, Tom Skinner, in, in terms of negotiating with President Putin, how do you think that's going to go? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Look, uh, uh, honestly, on that one, I don't know. You're going to plead the fifth? <laughs> I don't know. I, mean, the, I suppose the point is that he will be seen by the Russians as negotiating from a point of weakness and indeed ridicule. That's not a good place to be, I, I, is it? I mean, it, I mean, Putin is a powerful man. Let's, let's be honest. Like, it, you just see pictures on Twitter and Instagram of him like riding shirts on, a, on an horse like, with tanks behind him, <laughs> right? And we've got Boris Johnson, who's who's... Like Look getting ridiculed because he had a, he cut a cake in his back garden. Like, let's be honest, come on, he's, he's a, he comes across as a lot stronger leader than than Boris Johnson does, and I could imagine Boris just sort of faffing it up a little bit. Just <laughs> don't you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that. Like... I love that phrase. I should use that myself. <laughs> Lou. Well, look, I mean, joking aside, um, this is an incredibly perilous moment um, internationally. We've got tens of thousands of troops amassed on the Ukraine border. Um, With European allies are sending in defensive uh, weapons and equipment into the Ukraine. The US on last week handed um, a written response to Russia's demands, completely rejecting them. Obviously, um, we need this uh, diplomatic process to work. Um, And we do have bipartisan support across the House for what that process should be. But we do have a weakened Prime Minister who is unable to take very important calls with President Putin because he's answering questions about this in the House. This is the worst possible moment when we're facing a crisis internationally and domestic crises here that the Prime Minister should be in this position. Are you getting much constituency correspondence about Ukraine? Um... Very little, if I'm if I'm totally honest. Are, are, I think. are, are your employees talking about Russia and Ukraine? At all? No, it's all about sort of party gate in a minute. Yeah. But at, but you would expect in normal times for this to be a subject that your listeners and and shows would be completely dominated by. It mm. is a real well, an urgent threat, and yet everything is being drowned out by the allegations that the prime minister has prolonged because he has failed to mm. come clean at every single stage. That was exactly what I was going to say. This is what's wrong with everything that's going on. Is there's much bigger matters on in the world. I mean. I mean, if there was a war to happen, 
that is devastating. That it's the worst thing that could happen in the last, well, since World War Two, probably. You know, and 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 it's a serious, serious thing, and we're we're forgetting how serious it is because we're so fixated and stuck on what's gone on during lockdown about someone having a beer in a back garden. We do. So you think to... basically we've lost all sense of proportion? Of course. It's quite difficult on that, though, isn't it, Ben? Because, I mean, we get criticised, frankly, for whatever we do. If, if we spend an hour talking about Boris, we should be spending an hour talking about something else. If we do that, then people say, oh, you're, you're not talking about Boris, then that's because you want to support him. So it, it's, it's a very difficult balance to strike. Well, yeah, I'm going to res- respectfully disagree with Tom on that, Ian, because it, I don't think it is just about a cake. It's not just about a beer in the garden. There were reports since on the Sunday papers, actually, that talking so much about the cake and being ambushed by the cake was a concerted strategy from Number 10 to try to trivialise it. What this comes down to is whether or not the sitting Prime Minister and or his senior members of his staff broke the law in the middle of a pandemic, the same laws that they were enforcing on everyone else. Now, at that point, at this point, we don't know. Sue Gray seemed to hint that she thought they may have done, but we don't know. But that is a fundamentally important question. Is it as important as war in Ukraine? Well, of course, it's not either or. They are both significant matters. Potential conflict in Ukraine has the potential to destabilise the whole region, to destabilise, in fact, the whole of Europe and lead to a significant loss of life. So, yes, of course, but we can talk about both. I just don't agree with Tom, I think, when it is just about a cake or a beer, because I think it does get to more fundamental issues than that. OK, Matt. So, to just, I mean, just to answer your actual question if you if you look at what the pm is actually doing he is leading a pan european global effort to create a unified response to Putin and he is no, doing he, that. he's not. He's in the and, Commons well, answering no, no, questions no, 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 about no, no. his and, and mistakes. I'm not, I'm not disputing that he spent a couple of hours doing that but overall I think the reason why when Labour when David Lammy was asked would you be doing anything differently they say no is because they acknowledge that this is something that the Prime Minister is not only getting right for Britain but he's getting right in his uh, ability to lead a global coalition in response to what is probably the single most important issue that the world faces. Now, people may not like the fact that there is a distraction at home, but it doesn't change the fact that the PM's real focus is on those big ticket issues, okay. and Ukraine is about as big a ticket issue as it gets. Uh, we've got more time for questions. 0345 973 It's 847. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player. Conservative MP and Chief Secretary of the Treasury, Simon Clark. In the last two years, how have we benefited from having Brexited? The biggest single benefit came in the form of the vaccination programme where we were able to use our domestic regulation system. 155,698 people sadly died in this country of Covid and that saved your Brexit deal really, isn't it? You're not seriously going to pretend that we have control of our borders, are you? The challenge of, of tackling illegal migration is at the absolute top of the government's interim. The Prime Minister has been crystal clear. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. With the British Airways American Express accelerating business card. Check out the world. LBC.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Lou Haig, Matt Warman, Ben Kentish and Tom Skinner still with us. <laughs> Tom just said, are the callers live? <laughs> well, you're about to find out. <laughs> Sean in concert, are you live? Uh, I am alive, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your question, Sean? I'm not a liar, no. Um, at the end of the day, why did uh, Ian, Ian uh, Blackford have to walk out of the House of Commons when he was speaking the truth? And that Johnson knew he was speaking the truth. So this is the leader of the SNP in Westminster, Ian Blackford, who today was thrown out of the House of Commons by the Speaker because he accused the Prime Minister of misleading the House. Now, Ben Kentish can take us through exactly why that happened. Well, Ian, you're not allowed in Parliament to use unparliamentary language. You can say someone's inadvertently misled the House, but you cannot accuse them of lying, and that's what Ian Blackford effectively did in relation to Boris Johnson. Some people will say, well, he's got a point. Others will say no, and I think I agree with this. You can and Matt's right to say that Parliament is pretty pretty unedifying at the best of times. If it's allowed to descend into a complete debacle where everyone is calling everyone every word under the sun, you're a liar, you're this, you're that, it would be even worse than it can be now. So I think it's absolutely right that MPs aren't allowed to accuse each other of lying. They're not allowed to cast aspersions about each other's character. And yes, maybe that sort of limits the debate in a sense, but it does generally have the impression, give the uh, impression of keeping it a little bit, a little bit more respectable, uh, even though, as Matt says, I think it's still pretty uh, grim. At Do times. you think Ian Blackford deliberately tried to get thrown out today? Well, he's, 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 the SNP have done it before. I suspect, yes, he was given numerous opportunities to withdraw it. He didn't want to. I suspect it was a stunt to grab the attention. Not sure it worked, Ian, frankly. Do you think Keir Starmer would have been advised to do something a little bit like that? Maybe, maybe not get thrown out, but maybe just a little bit more full I don't, because I think what Keir Starmer needs to do is look like a Prime Minister in waiting. Ian Blackford, I'm pretty confident, as opposed to somebody who's never going to be the Prime Minister. <laughs> exactly. That is not the look he's going That's for. That's going to be my I memory think, from this yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think if he exactly doesn't become Keir, that, that description by Tom is going to be what? <laughs> I suspect that's already going viral on Twitter <laughs> as we speak and if it isn't our digital team need to put it on um lou uh, um yeah i mean I, I understand why people watch in frustration at parliament and the, and some of the ridiculous language that we're forced to use you know there's 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 rules that for example like we're never allowed to say you when we're talking to the prime minister or another member because we're always technically talking to the speaker in the chair um and i think unless you're actually in the chamber and and, and part of the debate it's difficult to understand um or follow those rules because they are very antiquated but i think um i agree that the chamber is already set up in a way that is so confrontational and encourages such um unedifying and aggressive behavior if we were able to shout you're a liar at each other frankly we'd be doing it on a daily basis and uh, it would probably descend into some fisticuffs at some point or another Matt? I mean, the whole point of all these arcane rules is to try and introduce some civility into the debate and and, and putting the speaker in as this intermediary and calling people your honourable friend or, or, or whatever is all about but what if he is a liar? Well, so, so I think it's you have to find sensible ways of getting your point across. And if you can't do that, then that, I, I think that probably says as much about the person trying to make the point as it does about the person that they're trying to accuse. I, I think what what went wrong for me today with, with what Ian Blackford did was simply that it is a sort of attention-seeking theatrics. And, and that is not the best use of Parliament. I don't think that's what uh, people elect him I to do. I can always feel anything. you clutching your pearls as you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 just th I just think there is, if you really think the best thing you can do is get chucked out of Parliament when you were elected to be in Parliament, then you could probably do with coming up with some better options. Tom? I completely agree. I think he's just trying to make a scene, isn't he, really? And just trying to get people to talk about him and, and look at him, and, and, and that's what he's done. And Which is what you really expect from the Liberal Democrats rather than the <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> Oh, they're not That's here it, to yeah. defend themselves. <laughs> they're not, but I think we, we do have a Liberal Democrat on very soon. Um, right, uh, Sean, thank you very much for that. Let's take a text from Sue in Clapham. Is the government's possible decision to U-turn over NHS staff needing to be vaccinated putting patients at risk? Now, I have to say, this is a new one on me. Are they thinking about doing that, Ben? 
Yes, they've announced today that they are going to look into so scrapping that plan. That have made it a legal requirement, of course, for frontline staff to be vaccinated. Uh, Sajid Javid uh, told MPs that ending the policy uh, was under consultation. So it's a full U-turn, and it sounds like that's the way it's going. In answer to uh, Sue's question, yes, I do think it's wrong. Uh, at this, in a sense, there it's understandable because there are very real concerns about tens of thousands of staff being lost. So is there an argument for delaying it? Yes, potentially. And Sajid Javid hasn't sort of ruled out doing that. However, if you are a frontline NHS worker and you are not willing to do something as basic as get a safe and effective jab, not just to protect you and to protect your patients, then in my view, you're in the wrong job. You're putting other people at risk. <coughs> For me, it's like not being willing to wash your hands or wear gloves or wear a mask in certain settings. It's wrong. It puts lives at risk. And I think if you are a frontline NHS staff, then you should have to be vaccinated, as of course they already have to be for things like hepatitis uh, B. So it's not that big a change in But policy. how long is this consultation going to last? Because as I understand it, if you haven't had your first vaccination by Wednesday, you are going to be sacked. Yes, it was, well, it was meant to come into uh, the effect on the 1st of April, as I understand it, Ian, needing your first jab, as you say, by Thursday. So we don't know. It's almost certainly now being delayed. I suspect it's being canned completely because, of course, we seem to be, touch wood, out the sort of worst of the pandemic. But that's not to say that another variant won't come along and it will be needed again. So I, I think it probably is something that's worth persisting with in the long term. So in, in some ways, though, if they are going to do this, you could argue, well, they only said they were going to do it to get people to get... The the jab in the first place and if many of them have done well anyway tom i i don't agree with exactly what you said i, I believe that everyone should be entitled to say yes or no to the jab Agreed. um obviously i mean the jab it does even does, healthcare workers yes i, I mean i do i mean to, for, to for some, you know, so many people to lose their job because they won't get a jab well that's terrible they're like they're frontline staff and what they've been through is I, I think it's up to them if they want to get it 100 percent. you know there's, but, but there's, if, if you're um, if a close relative of yours was in a care home mm. and you found out that the person caring for them had not been vaccinated and therefore was more likely to pass on COVID if they got it, you wouldn't be too impressed, would you? I wouldn't be too impressed, but I don't think it's for me to know if, if they've had a vaccination or not. That's for them to decide if they want to have it. And I don't think we should all put people on a pedestal whether they've had it or okay. not. That. I, th I think ultimately what this is, is a measure that was put in place at the very height of the pandemic. What Sajid Javid said today was that as a result of the very high levels of vaccination within the NHS anyway, yes, there are people who haven't done it yet, but there's there's a, a very much a continuing campaign to get them to do it. As a result of the success of the vaccine campaign, then we can now say this is a step that we do not currently need to take potentially, and that's why he's looking at the review. I do think if there is a balance that allows us to keep staff in the NHS while also saying we're very strongly encouraging you but we're not going to sack you if you haven't done it yet I think that is probably okay. a price worth paying Lou? I mean I think the discussion has shown how complex and difficult a decision and genuinely when I voted with the government on mandatory vaccines before Christmas it was, a, it was an exceptionally difficult vote, I don't believe in mandatory vaccinations but equally um, if any of my family were in hospital I would want them treated mm. by a vaccinated mm. um, frontline worker However, we have enormous <laughs> workforce pressures this in both about, the NHS well, and care. On the one hand, on the other well, yeah, hand, on the one hand, on the other hand. But these are the things, yes no answer, right? these are yeah. the things yeah. we're juggling, yeah. exactly. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and I think with those workforce pressures as they are, uh, at, the, at the very basis of this, though, all of us have to recognise and reassure the public that the vaccine is safe and that the best, um, the best force and the best case against um, COVID is to be triple jabbed. And it is a professional duty of all frontline workers to be vaccinated. Right. OK, final text from Ben in Abingdon. Uh, Tom's a star of reality TV. What reality TV show would the rest of the panel like to appear on? And for Tom, which cabinet job would you fancy? <laughs> I'm going to let you deliberate on that for a second. Lou, what, what's... Well, Strictly, obviously, that's like the most glam, Strictly, isn't it? I mean, I've got two left feet, but I'd like to at least... Um, oh, I'd like to see I'd like... Strictly. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to at least be away from Westminster for a few <laughs> weeks and maybe lose some weight. Matt? <laughs> If, if, if the Strictly team could teach me to dance, then they are working miracles. So maybe, maybe Lou and I can be the first parliamentary couple. I won't hold you to that, don't worry. So, uh, um, ben? I quite fancy two weeks in the jungle here. <laughs> yeah. I, quite, I don't think I'd like some of the trials, but two weeks in an Australian uh, rainforest sounds good to me. OK. I don't do it in Australia. Do you fancy two weeks in Wales? No, I'll wait till it goes back. Yeah, I think I, I would too. Um, Tom, which cabinet job would you like? I don't really know. I'd like to be in charge of... Uh, 
Help me out here a little bit. What's the Chancellor? <laughs> no, no. Get the education. Cap, the foreign policy. Edu yeah, education I'd like to be in charge of. And hospitality. All right, we'll combine those departments yeah. for you. I'd, I'd love... Business uh, and... Yeah, I'd love... Business and education. You know, you know look, I, I, I mean, I dyslexic. I struggled at school, but I went to a good school and, and, I, and I enjoyed it. But I believe that there's certain things that I, I studied at school that were completely pointless. You know, like, <laughs> I, there, there, but there was. Loads what are we cutting things. out? Fractions. <laughs> <laughs> With you on that. that sounds like a really good point to end okay. the programme. Thank you all very much. Matt Warman, Lou Haig, Ben Kentish and Tom Skinner. We'll be back with Cross Question tomorrow at 8 o'clock. But in the next hour, we're going to return to the subject of the day. Sue Gray's report. Is there any way back for Boris Johnson after today? It's two minutes past nine. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, Boris Johnson has met Conservative MPs this evening after a report into lockdown gatherings at Downing Street and Whitehall criticised failures of leadership and judgement. Sue Gray found events were difficult to justify and should not have been allowed and says there was an inappropriate amount